Hi there. So I promised I would tell a story. And I really don't want to, but... <laughs> I mean, I do, but I don't. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Now, I'm going to try to keep this as brief as I can. I'm not going to go into my whole life and all this stuff. I really just want to kind of go into how I got to where I am today in the most recent relapse, which was in 2013. Okay. So... I was raised by two addict parents, okay? I'm also an incredibly old soul, and I feel that addiction is an extra overlay put onto us. I absolutely was born with it. On brain scans, it can be shown that addicts have different receptors. Now, the brain can easily rewire those, so addiction is treatable. All right, now... I am not saying, when I say certain things, I am not trying to justify the behavior, okay? I have done horrible things, awful things, things I am not proud of. And, um, yeah, I, you know, please do not think that I have not felt bad about myself. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, so, but it's very important to note that addiction does not have to be substances. My primary problem, the, most, the biggest problem I've ever had in this incarnation is actually, or at least time-wise, the, the thing that has robbed me of the most time and almost made me flunk out of college was video games. Okay? I'm a gamer. I was when I was growing up. I'm not a gamer so much anymore. I really don't let myself play them very much. I've tried to turn my internet time into, um, you know, research time and stuff like that. And I have to make a very conscious effort to limit my screen time and stuff like that. So, I don't have to, but I do. Okay. Now, so I grew up with two addict parents, an alcoholic and an opiate and gambling addict. I was very, very aware of the fact that drugs are bad and we do not want to use them, okay? And I didn't even, like, drink alcohol and stuff socially. If I ever did anything with anybody, I did sometimes smoke marijuana, but that's it. And I do smoke cigarettes. Okay. Now, I didn't even drink. Like, in college, I've always hated alcohol. Oh, I despise it. Okay. All right. So, I ran out. I was dependent totally on financial aid to go to college. And when I was, after I did my first four years, I had changed my major and the first year. And so, um, they would not give me financial aid for a fifth year. Okay. So, I had to stop going to college after I'd done four years, and I came back home, I moved in with my mother at first, and then I got an apartment with a college, or with a high school friend, and, um, we, uh, I started waiting tables. So, while I waited tables, one thing that is very popular in the restaurant industry, or at least around here at the time, was cocaine. And it did, it did improve your performance and stuff like that. Well, so anyways, let's just say 2003, um, yeah, I almost killed myself on cocaine. And at that time, addicts use for one reason, okay? Well, yeah. The one reason is to escape either physical or emotional pain or feelings that one cannot deal with. It is a lack of coping skills. There... Sometimes one can be prescribed something or one can experiment as a child, like, you know, take drinking at a party or something, and not know that they have the addict's mind and that it's going to, you know, become a problem for them. Now, that's also a possibility. It doesn't always, but anyways, it's typically like, yeah, it's to hide, run from feelings, okay, and lack of coping skills. So, we have to keep that in mind. People don't... And by the time somebody is homeless and living out on the street and has lost everything and all that, I mean, to sit there and say, drugs are bad and I'm a mortician and I see addiction every day and if you don't stop doing drugs, you'll die. 
That, that is completely unhelpful. That doesn't, uh, yeah, of course. You know, an addict knows that. And do you think that half them addicts aren't wishing for death? I'm going to tell you because they are. All right? That is no way to live. It is no way to live, especially as a junkie. Oh, my goodness. And had I not experienced what I've experienced, I would not have this empathy. And I am grateful. Okay? So, 2003, I almost snort my life away. So, I get down to like 90 pounds, all this shit. So, I, after about a year of something, I can't, I don't do it anymore. I, I, I mean, something kicks in me and it's like, Ginger, come on. So, it's like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. I'm gonna kill myself. So, I, I tell my mom, you know, I, you gotta get me a job at your office or something. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing well. And I didn't tell her why. I mean, she just thought it was like mental health and I was working too much there and all that stuff. My mother actually thought I'd never done a drug at all, which became a problem later. So, anyways, um, so it's like, okay. So, she gets me a job at her office. Well, there I meet my husband. And so... He, you know, basically tells me, well, if you ever do drugs again, you know, I'll leave you, blah, blah, blah. Which, you know, that's really supportive and that's great. But at the same time, maybe it's a, you know, it, it was an ultimatum that probably kept me from maybe doing some other things. I don't know. Because when I was, my dad had real bad fibromyalgia. That's why he ended up, and so did his mother. And that's why he ended up using opiates and when I was 26 and I woke up one morning and I was in so much pain I couldn't sit up, I knew what I had to. The pain had been getting chronically worse. Um, and the thing with fibromyalgia is your muscles knot up. Like, the muscles typically lie flat, but in a person with fibromyalgia, your muscles knot up and spasm all the time and they become a rope-like structure. And, um... Like, I have, they're called trigger points. Muscle knots are called trigger points. And I probably have a million, okay, literally. Every time I go get a massage, within one to two minutes of being massaged, every masseuse says, you have fibromyalgia, don't you? But a doctor, 50% of the medical community still says it's bullshit. Well, I can tell you it's not bullshit. But anyways, so, all right. So, I, you know, the pain got worse, but, so my husband and I get married in 2004, I have a child in 2005, my grandpa dies, he goes, he lapses into his final coma the day my son is born, okay, and then my grandmother dies a year later, my maternal grandparents were incredibly close, we were incredibly close, and I freaking started drinking, okay, I'm not even a drinker, and did that for about a year. And then in 2007, it was 2007 I started doing it. And then it was like beginning of 2008 or something that I started going to AA. It's like, I can't do this anymore. I've had enough. Okay, now AA is helpful. And it, um, you know, I mean, I would recommend that any addict, anybody that wants recovery, read those books. A, A, and N, A, but we must keep in mind that it is a program. It is a mind control program still, and nobody knows better for you than you, okay? So, I hate when I see addicts, recovering addicts or alcoholics or something, suffering with something because the AA book tells them they can't take a medicine for it. Well, that's, you know, that's not helpful. Okay. A star? Okay, baby. I'll, I'll come in and look at it in a second. Okay, so anyways, but it was helpful. And um, so I was sober, you know, I get sober. And um, I went to meetings for about a year. And then my husband and I actually decided to join a church and all this stuff. Well, so I graduated college in 2009 and then in April of 2010. So I got sober in February 2007. Eight. Excuse me. No. Yes. And so then I graduate college. So I went back to school in August of 08. I graduated college in December of 09. And then I got a job at the West Virginia Division of Justice as an accountant. And I paid out grant funds. Okay. 
So this was a very small agency and it had like 30, 30 to 50 people that worked in it max. And so uh, there were these criminal justice specialists that managed the grant money. Like they would decide what was approved, like what put, was put in the budgets and all that stuff. But then the accountants are what paid it out. You know, we would pay it out per their approved budget and stuff. And then there were some other things like the state of West Virginia, it was a cash-based reimbursement system. So therefore, if somebody had prepaid their rent, I can't pay for that in advance. I can give it to you each month as, as the month has, as the, um, you know, expenditure is incurred. And so the previous accounting department, you know, when I would say, when they would say, I can't pay that, they'd be like, the criminal justice specialist would be like, well, why not? And the accountant would be like, because I said so. Well, okay. That, and, and the truth, truth being told, they didn't really know why. Um, they just did what the, they were told, but that's, that's what the bottom line really is. But anyways, so, well, when Ginger gets there, that's not how Ginger operates, okay? So, I would say, well, I can't pay for this. And they'd be like, well, why not? And I'd be like, well, okay, picture this. Six months into this lease, we've prepaid our rent for 12 months. Six months into this lease, the building burns down. They move, they get a refund of the $6,000 that they've prepaid to this landlord, or they get somehow reimbursed by, say, an insurance company or, you know, whatever. I don't know. And... Where's our recourse? Are they gonna cut us a check back for that $6,000 or not? Likely not, you know what I'm saying? So, and sometimes this was hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so it's like, you know, that's why we don't pay ahead of time. We just don't pay ahead of time. I'm not saying I won't pay it, but we need to do it month to month. You know, they're gonna get the full $12,000 back, but they're gonna get it a thousand a month over the next year instead of $12,000 today. Now, I really, really, really revamped that office. I mean, I'm actually really proud of what I did there. I mean, anybody that worked there, you know, I mean, accounting, like, just the whole, because there was just this animosity between accounting and the, and I really smoothed all that over. I was there for almost five years. Well, in this amount of time, one of my criminal justice specialists was named Bonnie. And she had moved here. I'm in West Virginia. She had moved here from Texas. She was like 28 or something when she moved, maybe 25, 26 or so. She turned 30 when we were at this office. So, you know, I don't know. She was in her mid twenties. She had a master's degree and she gets out of college and I don't know. She'd like, she was from Texas and she'd like worked in a prison or something. And then somehow, so anyways, People at work would theorize on, you know, people, she was really kind of aggressive and obnoxious and just very much, um, very closed minded, uh, very much that, you know, well, this is what I believe and so that's it. Like wouldn't hear your, your perspective. And, um, she's very, you know, very big into the church, which is, which is normal, you know, for people like that to be closed minded. They, but anyways, and she's now a youth leader at a church, and she also used to have fantasies about teenage boys, so I don't know if that's a good idea, but not my place. Anyhow, so, I would hear people talking about her, you know, and of course, it was this one guy named Nick that was, you know, always preached to be, oh, the biggest Christian and all this stuff, and he actually, like, I mean, he created a game of let's, you know, it was called Bonnie Bingo, and let's see how many times Bonnie talks about her dad today, stuff like that. Like, and, you know, but I felt bad for her, okay? I knew that there was some struggle in her, and there was some reason that she, and she wasn't the prettiest girl, and she had really, really big, like those real big, she needed a breast reduction. Anyway, and she had had lymphoma when she was 20. And she, you know, did chemo the whole bit. It's a wonder she's alive and all this stuff. People would question whether or not she even had chemo. Because Bonnie ended up kind of being a little bit of a liar. And she would embellish things and stuff. But it was a lack of self-esteem. Anyways, 
So I befriended her and I actually ended up liking the girl, okay? Like really liking her and she became one of my best friends. And I figured out that she moved here because when she was, when she had lymphoma, she got addicted to opiates. And West Virginia is known as one of the, well, around the country, I found out in rehab, we are known as the pillbillies. And like, let's just say that during this, this was right short after like the whole Oxycontin had been taken off the market and stuff like that, that she would have moved here. And it was when pills were starting to become harder to get. So I think she moved here because she was an opiate addict and she, she didn't, she needed to get, I mean, because this job, it was like a $28,000 a year job. She didn't know anybody here. I mean, it just, it's the only, I mean, people that they speculated that she had been raped or something and she was running from something. And I mean, maybe, but she was running to something. But anyways, I didn't figure all this out until later. Okay, so 2011, I get pregnant with Charlotte. And I was terrified of being pregnant with Charlotte because uh, pregnancy can exacerbate fibromyalgia symptoms. And when I was pregnant with Noah, I had a really miserable time. But with the girls, it actually didn't end up being that bad. My fibromyalgia symptoms were relieved a lot during pregnancy, which makes me think that there's a hormonal aspect to it, but that's another subject. So Bonnie and I, became, Bonnie had always wanted a child more than anything, okay? And she, um, but she didn't have a man. I mean, they may be able to stand her attitude. And uh, then she had that closet addiction. Plus, she uh, had had lymphoma and was likely sterile from the chemo. Chemo typically, you know, makes it very hard for people to have children. Or she was told she was sterile or something. So she wanted children more than anything. Okay. So when she finds out I'm having a baby, she leeches onto that like a vulture. But I actually needed the help, and I really did genuinely like the girl, okay? I ended up becoming, you know, I really ended up genuinely liking her. I saw her trauma. I saw her, I mean, I'm an empath. I felt her insecurities. I felt her whatever. And her trauma is all caused by the church, by the way. She had a really good upbringing and stuff. Her entire thing is religious trauma. But, okay, so... I've been sober, you know, a few days. Okay, so I have Charlotte in April of 2012. And um, it was when she was a little over a year old that I really, really got in pain, you know, like lugging her around, the emotional abuse I was experiencing at home. I also had an eight-year-old son that was... His dad was, I mean, it was just, it was always so stressful, and I was in so much pain. So, one day, Bonnie comes into my office, and she sets down two or three pain pills, lower tabs. And I asked her, you know, what it was and stuff like that, and she tells me, and she's like, oh, to help your pain and stuff. And I hesitated. I thought, I, I didn't say anything to her. I said thank you to her or whatever, and... Um, let her go, but I hesitated taking them. You know, I thought, you know, this probably isn't a good idea. This is the last thing I need. I mean, if these things help, I'm going to want more. And my dad was an opiate addict. But at the same time, I was in so much physical pain. It's like, well, fuck it, you know, I won't be able to get more. <laughs> I took it. And damn, they helped. Oh, they helped. They helped more than I thought. So, we started a spiral. And this is in 20, about the summer of 2013. By November, so Bonnie began to give me pills regularly. Well, when by November of 2013, when I was taking too many of her pills, she started telling me that the doctor had cut her off. You know, which I knew was bullshit, but whatever. I knew that she knew that I was taking too much of her pills. And at this point, I was wanting to start hiding it anyways. And so, I, uh, my dad was an opiate addict. And I told him what I was dealing with. And he helped me. And he, he enabled some. I mean, he did get me pills. But 
you know, he also uh, encouraged us going to NA meetings, and um, he wanted me to go to re I mean, my dad was always very, very supportive. My dad was my best friend, and yes. And my dad help, has helped me out more than, more than y'all can imagine. So, this is November 2013. She cuts me off, so... January 30th, 2014. My husband and I had started marriage counseling in September 2013, and during this six-month period or five-month period of this counseling, I realized that I had been married to a man that knew absolutely nothing about me for 10 years. He didn't give a shit about me. He knew nothing about me. He was a textbook narcissist, and I tried everything I could to help him, and I could not, and yeah, he was draining me. He was killing me, and I had to leave. But he was an attorney, and he had already told me before, you know, if you take my kids, you don't leave. If you, kidna if you take the kids, I'll say you kidnapped them. I'll say you did all kinds of stuff. And, yeah, he did. Now, he didn't say I kidnapped him, but he did say all kinds of stuff when we went in court. He basically goes in there and describes good fellows, and it was a bad thing. And so then they took all my parental rights away, and he was horrified by that. He was like, holy shit, that's not what I was wanting. He was like, yeah, like, he, like, babysat me that night, so I wasn't suicidal. He was like, I'm not taking your kids. I'm not taking your kids away, Ginger. Please, just, he's not a bad man. He got scared. He heard the word divorce. His parents had a horrible divorce. He foresaw this horrible divorce. My parents had an amicable divorce, amicable divorce, and I knew ours would be too, but it just needed time. But anyways, so January 30th, 2014, on the seven-year anniversary of my grandmother's death, I had been accused of not being in traffic for two hours when I sat in gridlock traffic for two hours because of an accident on my way home. It should have been a five-minute trip, but literally it took maybe, an, it might have been one hour, but whatever. He, I'd been communicating with him the whole time. It's like, you know, I mean, and he kept saying I wasn't in traffic. And I'm, like, sending him pictures of the car in front of me. It's like, dude, I am in traffic, okay? But I get home, and because of this, you know, dinner was late and stuff like that. And by God, dinner better be on the table at 6 o'clock, not 6.05, you fucking bitch. Okay? That's what I lived with for 10 years. And uh, so, that day I had enough. And I already had a bag packed. So this is January 30th, 2014. So I, I left and I went to my friend Mary Charlotte's to stay. So then, February 12th, eight, eight to 12. I don't know. Ended up in a traffic stop and I had drugs on me, and I assumed that the police were going to find these drugs, and so, hi, mama. hi, baby, and so I began to act crazy, because I did not want to detox in jail, I would rather detox in the hospital, it was an ingenious idea, it worked like a charm, too, so they took me to the hospital instead of jail, well, I had texted my friend that I was staying with, Mary, and told her, I'm not going to be there tonight, because I've gotten into a traffic situation and well I've gotten into a situation and I'm going to the hospital but I'm okay you know I just you know it'd be nice if you come up here but I'm okay yeah well she couldn't come up here because she didn't want to wake her daughter up in the middle of the night and stuff but she would have come up there and she would have never done this we've been friends for 30 years and we don't really talk much anymore and I don't really know what happened there and I might go into that story one day but I mean we're not not friends we just I don't know but anyways okay so, she knows I'm friends with this Bonnie girl at work, right? So, she had her number. She happened to have her number because of, like, I guess Charlotte being born or something. I don't know. So, she contacts Bonnie. Bonnie comes to the hospital. Well, at this point, I had been being given, like, sedatives and stuff. And, because these nurses kept saying, because when they, when they take you in on a mental thing, they restrain you, okay? They put your hands and your feet in there, and, and that's cool, but they had my right ankle restraint so, so tight that, I mean, I was, I mean, I was in some, I'm like, can you please, I, I'm not asking you to take it off. I'm not, can you loosen that restraint? 
And like my heart rate was like 200 beats a minute because of this pain and my blood pressure was through the roof and stuff. And they're like, and I hear these nurses, they're putting this stuff in an IV behind me, like in my spine. They're trying to get this, this stuff down. And I, and I told them and they're like, they're like shooting me up with stuff. And, and I hear one say to the other, they're like, why is she still thrashing? She should be dead by now. And I was like, ladies, before you kill me, could you just listen to this one sentence and let's just try this? Humor me. I was like, could you just loosen that right ankle strap? I'm not asking you to take it off, but could you please loosen it? I can assure you that within one minute of you doing that, my heart rate's going to come down. And it did. But, anyways, so, <laughs> somebody called Bonnie. Bonnie comes in the hospital room. And I am acting crazy by this point because I am so mad about them not listening to me about this ankle restraint. And, uh, okay, honey, hold on just a minute. What are you doing? Okay, just a second. And I'm so mad about this ankle restraint. So anyways, so I say when she comes in there, I remember saying, who called her? She's going to tell the whole office. And I was on FMLA leave, so I'd never really intended on telling my boss about all this. Oh, she did one better than tell the whole office. She wrote a signed, sworn statement. And gave it to our boss that said that I was on drugs, selling drugs. And I mean, she was talking about drugs like, according to my, I never read the statement. My ex-husband did because he was my lawyer that represented me in the lawsuit that transpires after all this. But he said that it accused me of like being on cat tranquilizers and special K and uh, I don't know, like, it's just basically every drug under the sun. She like, you know, and like my talk screen, of course, came back for, um, it, I didn't even have any opiates in my system at that time because I had been trying to detox myself and I'd been doing okay. And I, the drugs that I had gotten, I was on my way to go do them. I had not gotten to do them, but the police didn't find the drugs. The drugs were actually there in my purse when I picked it up from the hospital and I did them when I got out, but... That's another matter. So, I end up voluntarily saying, yeah, I'll go, you know, for a three-day hold in the psych facility. And I, you know, and I wanted to do that anyways because I was struggling. I didn't know how to get help, you know. And uh, I didn't know how to get off this by myself. I had tried to detox by myself and stuff, but it was just really overwhelming. And, um... So while I was in this three-day hold, my husband, you know, asked, I mean, he agreed to send me to, like, this really good rehab, and he, like, paid a bunch of money to send me to, like, one of, the, like, these top rehabs, and that was an invaluable experience that I learned coping skills, and I actually got the mental health care that I needed, and so now, when I have trauma, I don't think about using drugs. I mean, my dad died three years ago and I didn't even think about using. I mean, I've been, you know, and it's, but it's that mental health care that so many people don't get. And it's that mental health care that I hadn't had before when she set those pills down. But I tell you why, you know, cause I'm just very good at reading people. And she did what she was trying to protect herself. She thought that what I was going to do, I know this is what she thought. She thought that what I was going to do is that I was going to say, she knew that our boss was going to find out that I was on drugs. And so she thought that I was going to say, now our boss would have never even found out about this had she not told, but she thought that I was going to say that well, it's Bonnie's fault that I'm on drugs because Bonnie gave me the drugs all the, you know, six months ago and Bonnie's been supplying me the drugs and Bonnie's been doing all that. I would have never done that. I would have never done that. I would have never brought her name into it. You know, because I do know, I, but that's what she did. And you know what else she did? I went into rehab for um, 28 days. I was gone for four weeks. And by the time I got home, she'd moved to Texas. 
I never even got the chance to confront her. She will not talk to me. She is a youth leader at a church in Texas. Her name is Bonnie Beavers. B-O-N-N-I-E-B-E-V-E-R-S. Look her up on Facebook. If she ever tries to befriend you, stay away. <laughs> she will turn on you. I mean, I've just, I've never. But you know what? But seriously, I, I really am grateful. And so, since that time, you know, I have been fine. And uh, I'm, I'm good. I'm a recovering addict. I, uh... <laughs> And it's okay. It's okay to be one. And, um, you know, I would have never had empathy, you know. But, <laughs> oh, man, that's a dark road. That's a dark path. That is a dark path. And um, none of them want to live this way. None of them. None of us. None of us. So let's end the stigma. Let's end the stigma of mental health. Let's stop giving advice to addicts if we have no experience with it ourselves. Instead, let's listen and let's keep an open mind. You know, that's the only support I ever asked for. All I ever asked for was a listening ear. I, you know, I don't wish ill will on her. I don't wish ill will on anybody. I do hope that she never does this to someone else. I do hope that she has a hard time finding friends. Um, as far as people to confide in her and stuff because she's somebody that'll turn right around and use it against you. And that's not, no. No, that ain't cool. Oh, heck. So, you know, and I've, I've lost, I mean, I, you know, I got to know some really great people over that year then that dark path because that oh okay by the way yeah so when i get out of rehab in february 2014 uh that's when we go to court my husband takes my kids away gets a six month restraining order on me and all this stuff and everything and so that kind of spirals me out of control and so i didn't um i went to rehab i got home in march of 2014 but i didn't actually get clean until December 26, 2014. And that was when I started an outpatient treatment program. And I've done it ever since. Um, I still go once a week just to see a therapist. And I take two random drug tests a month. But I've rambled on and on. I'm sorry. But yeah, it's just really something. How? But I'm grateful. I'm grateful everything happened the way that it did. And that's that. Have a good one.